Major funding for this series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, by public television stations, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over a hundred years providing worldwide business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers. Additional funding is provided by the George D. Smith Fund, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and other contributors. This program contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. These people who say that uh, we ought to withdraw from Vietnam are wholly wrong because if we withdrew from Vietnam, the communists would control Vietnam. Pretty soon Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya would go and all of Southeast Asia would be under the control of the communists and under the domination of the Chinese. If this little nation goes down the drain and can't maintain her independence, Ask yourself what's going to happen to all the other little nations. Bucket five, this is bucket two six, receiving fire, nine o'clock, yellow smoke, 200 meters, automatic weapons, over. Lyndon Johnson inherited America's commitment to an anti-communist government in South Vietnam and 16,000 military advisors. Some were more than advisors in the war against the communist-led insurgents, the Viet Cong. The fire team will lead the attack, followed by the rocket shift in 2-3, over. Now, let's bring it around here. Okay, this is 2-6. We have somehow some people running along the dikes. Actually, the uh, canal is perpendicular to the one you're attacking now. They have on black uniforms. I estimate approximately 3-0. Do you have them inside, over? Uh, this is 2-3. Roger, we have them inside. Uh, we're engaged at present time. Roger. Good job. I saw you splatter one right in the back with a rocket. Roger got lucky again. Johnson's main concern at the time was not this growing war in Asia, but another war at home. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. Few American presidents have been as successful as Johnson in promoting their programs in Congress. He later called his the Great Society. We are going to build a great society where no man or woman are the victim of fear or poverty or hatred. Where every man and woman has a chance for fulfillment and prosperity and hope. But there was Vietnam. As Johnson took office, peasants, often helped by the Viet Cong, destroyed the strategic hamlets designed to isolate them from the Viet Cong. President Diem had built them, but now Diem was dead, and the structure he had created with American support was being smashed. General Min had ousted Diem with American approval. He lasted three months. General Khan, with American blessing, took over in a bloodless coup. The political turmoil deepened.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I present the Secretary of Defense of the United States of America, Mr. McNamara. President Johnson offered America's full support to this new, untried leader. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. General Taylor and I have known General Kahn for a considerable period of time. He has our admiration, our respect, and our complete support. How do you do? You know, the vice premier... Very good, too. McNamara barnstormed South Vietnam with Khan, trying to promote him to his own people. Privately, McNamara was gloomy. He warned Johnson that the Viet Cong controlled 40% of the countryside. We are here to emphasize that the United States will maintain its interest and its presence in your country. There is no question whatsoever of our abandoning that interest. We'll stay for as long as it takes. We shall provide whatever help is required to win the battle against the communist insurgents. To the communists in Hanoi, America's presence in the South was yet another act of foreign aggression. They recalled 1,000 years of struggle against foreign invaders, Chinese, Japanese, French. And now they faced Americans. I should emphasize that the United States supported the French throughout the War of Resistance, throughout the French colonial war in Vietnam. The United States opposed the Geneva Conference and it refused to sign the Geneva Agreements. The United States replaced the French in the South in order to continue the war through No Dinh Diem and its other puppets. And then the United States intervened directly in the war. Ho Chi Minh stepped up his support for the Viet Cong at the same time Johnson renewed the American commitment to defeat them. Each responded to the chaos in the South with new resolve. During the final months of 1963, Diem was shot and Kennedy was assassinated. So the situation in the South changed. Just at that time, President Ho Chi Minh called on all Vietnamese to double their efforts to help the people in the South. The resistance forces in the South were still very weak and badly equipped. In certain areas, they had trouble recruiting troops. Therefore, we decided that well-equipped and larger forces had to be sent to the South. Chinese advisors wanted us to wage only a small-scale guerrilla war. They told us to maintain the Ho Chi Minh Trail as it had always been. They wanted us to transport supplies to the south on our backs and shoulders, as if we were ants filling up anthills. But our decision, the decision of our party, our leaders, and our Supreme High Command, was to widen the trail into a modern communication system capable of moving regular army units. Hanoi decided to escalate the war, and the Viet Cong stepped up their attacks in the countryside. When Lyndon Johnson inherited the presidency, he inherited many things, but one of them was the legacy of the Vietnam War. And the Democratic presidents felt need not to lose one square foot of territory to communism, particularly in Asia, to draw the line, to hold the line, and to keep the presidency thereby. Because if you lose, the, the final domino in the domino sequence is not some Asian country, it's the presidency itself. In 1964, the pressure on Johnson to hold the line against communism came from Republican conservatives. In July, they nominated Senator Barry Goldwater for president. He was an outspoken anti-communist. I 
would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Johnson wanted a big victory, and he wanted to keep Vietnam out of the campaign. As early as May, he had his aides draft a resolution of congressional support for the war effort. One of the mistakes he thought Harry Truman made was to be involved in Korea without congressional approval. Therefore, he determined at some propitious moment that he would bring the Congress in and have them approve whatever the objectives were to be determined to be in Vietnam. It was discovered, however, in researching the Senate that uh, the introduction of such a resolution would cause a very major filibuster by two or three strong opponents of the war at the time and therefore do more harm than good, create not consensus but conflict. Therefore, by June 15th, um, 64, the idea of a resolution had been shelved. In late July, the USS Maddox, a destroyer on an intelligence mission, sailed into the Gulf of Tonkin off North Vietnam. It was later joined by the USS Turner Joy. These two destroyers became involved in an incident which brought the congressional resolution off the shelf. The Navy explained the incident this way. In international waters in the Gulf of Tonkin, destroyers of the United States Navy are assigned routine patrols from time to time. Sunday, August the 2nd, 1964, the destroyer Maddox was on such a patrol. Shortly after noon, the calm of the day is broken as general quarters sound. In a deliberate and unprovoked action, three North Vietnam PT boats unleash a torpedo attack against the Maddox. At once, the enemy patrol boats are brought under fire by the destroyer. The film charged an unprovoked attack, but it left out crucial facts. Early in the morning of July 31st, unmarked South Vietnamese patrol boats had attacked two North Vietnamese island bases, part of a covert operation supported by the CIA. The next night, the Maddox was cruising up the coast, at one point as close as five miles. It changed course. And early on August 2nd was 10 miles off one of the islands raided earlier. North Vietnam's patrol boats attacked the Maddox six hours later. Hanoi linked the Maddox to the South Vietnamese raids. There was a link. Knowing in advance that uh, from the South Vietnamese that the uh, commando attacks were going to take place, it was uh, very useful for the United States for its own purpose in knowing the terrain in that area to pick up the electronic signals and any messages that were relayed back and forth uh, indicating where North Vietnamese forces were, what they were doing, and what their reactions to the attacks were. Now, from the point of view of North Vietnam, I'm feel confident uh, they considered U.S. and South Vietnamese forces in complete collusion to embarrass and damage uh, North Vietnamese uh, military facilities uh, threatening the South. At the time, Secretary McNamara stressed that the Maddox was simply on a routine patrol. No, there, it has no special relationship to, to uh, uh, any uh, operations in that area. We, we're carrying routine patrols of this kind uh, on all over the world all the time. Following the Sunday attack, the Maddox is joined by the USS Turner Joy. As directed by the President of the United States, the Maddox and Turner Joy resume patrol operations in the Gulf of Tonkin. On the night of August the 4th, North Vietnamese patrol boats strike again, as filmed in this recreation. The determination of all Americans to carry out our full commitment to the people and to the government of South Vietnam will be redoubled by this outrage. Yet our response for the present will be limited and fitting. We Americans know 
although others appear to forget, the risk of spreading conflict. We still seek no wider war. For the first time, American aircraft bombed North Vietnam. The retaliation came after the second incident, an incident Hanoi has always denied. On the night of August 4th, the United States made public the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident. But the story was a fabrication created by the U.S. National Security Council. Even as the National Security Council met, American aircraft were being sent to destroy several areas of our country. In reality, the second Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. At that time, I felt it was questionable whether the second incident took place. I simply was not sure. Uh, it was not until after a number of days of uh, collation of reports in the field had taken place that, it, that many of the reports which seemed to relate to the second incident were proved either to be unsound or to relate to the first incident. This is what intelligence analysis is all about. And in a military situation, quite often, the commanding officers, uh, in this case the President of the United States, don't wait for the details to be settled. If they feel they're in a critical situation with a danger of military conflict, they make decisions without waiting for the intelligence detail. He felt that it represented, if not an escalation of the war on their part, at least uh, a punch in the nose in a way that would humiliate a great power if it didn't respond. All of this went through his mind, and he also saw it as one dramatic way in which after weeks and months of seeming indecision, he could convey to Hanoi, to Saigon, and to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue that you were not dealing with uh, a softy. Well, I think that pr President Johnson has done the correct thing. I really do. I don't think that uh... He could have done otherwise, you feel especially the when they attacked our American flag, yeah. I'm behind him on it. I'm not for Johnson. I'm for Goldwater, but I'm behind him on this. The minute incident number one happened, the attack on our ships, um, the resolution was brought right back off the shelf, put right to Congress, and, uh, of course, uh, after incident number two, sailed through uh, with uh, virtually no dissent, a blank check. Senator William Fulbright, persuaded the second incident had occurred, whisked the resolution through Congress in two days. Well, I think it's a very clear demonstration of the unity of the country behind the policies that are being followed by the president in South Vietnam, and more specifically of the action that was taken in response to the attack upon our destroyers. It shows a practically unanimous approval. It was unanimous in the House, and only two uh, dissented in the Senate. Being in the minority never proves that you're wrong. In fact, history is going to record that Senator Greening and I voted in the interest of the American people this morning when we voted against this resolution. And I'd have the American people remember what this resolution really is. It's a resolution which seeks to give the President of the United States the power to make war without a declaration of war. Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. Congress gave the President full authority for military action in Southeast Asia. Backed by both political parties, Johnson had removed the war as an issue from the campaign. In the White House for the last 20 years, five presidents from both parties have adopted a bipartisan foreign policy. That bipartisan foreign policy has kept us out of war and has kept it as peace 
and has left your boy at home. And that's the way it ought to be. And that's the way it's going to be after November the 3rd. Johnson didn't seek a wider war. He didn't want a wider war. He knew the war would engulf everything that he wanted to do in this country. At the same time, uh, he also knew that if he didn't fulfill what he thought was an honorable commitment from the United States to South Vietnam, his administration could be lost as well. Barry Goldwater began after the nomination to try to be Mr. Moderate, Mr. Respectable. He tried to stand more in the center of the Republican Party than on the far right. And the president said to me one day, we've got to remind people of what Barry Goldwater was B.C., before the convention. the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Thus Johnson portrayed Goldwater as irresponsible and himself as the candidate of restraint. He won a landslide victory. On the eve of the election, the Viet Cong attacked an American air base near Saigon. They destroyed aircraft used in operations against them. More planes had been sent after the Tonkin incidents. Escalation was breeding escalation. I recommended a, re a retaliatory airstrike for the bombing of uh, uh, a Bien Hoa air base which was occupied largely by American aircraft and the losses in personnel were all, all American. This was the first time the enemy had ever, uh, ever attacked a major military installation of the Americans. It was a change of tactics. It shouldn't be shrugged off, I thought, as just another thing instead of the war. It was something new. And it was an excellent reason to have a, have a retaliatory strike. American carriers were poised. But President Johnson refused his ambassador's recommendation to bomb North Vietnam. The Viet Cong attacked again. At the end of November, I was given the order to attack the Brinks Hotel, which housed high American officers. All the crimes committed by the Americans were directed from this nerve center. I sat in a nearby cafe to wait for the explosion, which occurred at exactly 5.45 on the afternoon of December 24th, the anniversary of the founding of the People's Army of Vietnam. Our commanders had ordered us to attack the place when the most Americans were there. And it was precisely as we had expected, since they were at the Brinks Hotel to plan their Christmas activities. Many Americans had also gone there from the Rex Hotel. As a result, the attack succeeded, and we were never detected. The Christmas Eve attack was the second major assault on Americans in two months. Ambassador Taylor called once more for a bombing strike against the North. Again, Johnson refused. Again, recommended retaliation, got uh, turned down. I, was, I felt reasonably sure, who wants to bomb Santa Claus? <laughs> Four days after the Viet Cong team blew up the Brinks Hotel, Two Viet Cong regiments prepared to strike the village of Binh Za near Saigon. They inflicted the first of a series of devastating defeats on Saigon's army.
focus was uh, the use of battalion sized units, reinforced battalion sized units by the enemy, and the successful use that I feared would, uh, would spread and was perhaps the beginning of a gradual movement uh, toward uh, a major effort uh, uh, using not guerrillas, not small units, uh, but uh, large units. It was not until we were presented with a larger war that the decision then had to be made as to whether we would um, let them get what they were after or whether we would make a greater effort ourselves. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy already favored a greater effort when he arrived in Saigon in early February 1965. He had recently urged the president to bomb North Vietnam. The president has asked me to extend the New Year's greetings to all the people of Vietnam and to express his conviction that the year of the snake can be one in which security and prosperity grow in Vietnam. While McGeorge Bundy was in Saigon, the Viet Cong attacked an American outpost at Pleiku in the Central Highlands. It was the third attack on Americans in three months. Eight died. 126 were wounded. Uh, we found our friends in Washington on the wire and uh, uh, they wanted our recommendation. Uh, took us a little while to concert a view, which was that this episode did call for a reply. In the first raid, land-based planes were forced back by the weather, but the carrier jets completed their strike with the loss of one American plane. Later, photo reconnaissance flights proved that much of the staging area had been completely destroyed. The confrontation between the Reds and the West was the most critical since the Gulf of Tonkin incident last summer, when the U.S. replied just as swiftly to North Vietnam PT boat attacks. President Johnson explained what had happened, explained what he had believed was essential the decision to conduct rep a reprisal and to have a clear-cut policy of uh, further bombings as required in circumstances that seemed very likely to arise. In effect, a, a real change in, in the way we were acting. A few days later, Johnson gave the green light to sustained bombing in North Vietnam. He hoped to bolster Saigon's morale. But there was a coup attempt in Saigon on February 19th. The bombing was to begin the next day, coordinated with the Saigon government. Ambassador Taylor canceled it. The government was in turmoil. In fact, it had been in turmoil for months. When Khan took advantage of the Tonkin incidents the previous August to tighten his grip, students had rioted. Buddhists also protested. But demonstrating Buddhists threatened the Catholics they staged a sit-down strike. After 10 days, Khan formed a triumvirate to try to rule South Vietnam. Four days later, Khan resigned. He said he was ill. Who is the man who can lead Vietnam to victory? <laughs> well, I think you got me there. Acting Prime Minister Nguyen Huan, a Harvard-educated economist, lasted three days. Then Khan returned. Although I have not yet quite recovered from my illness, I do my best to return today to assume the responsibility of leading the government in these critical times. A week later, in mid-September, there was a coup attempt. The thing that worried Johnson and constantly worried him was the instability of the South Vietnamese government. So I guess you might call the coat of arms of the Vietnamese government was a turnstile, for God's sake. And, and I remember very vividly, uh, somebody would come in his office and say, there's a, looks like there's a coup beginning in Vietnam again. Another coup, you know, coups were like, a, like fleas on a dog. And Johnson said, I don't want to hear any more about this coup shit. I've, I've had enough of it. And we've got to find a way to stabilize those people out there. That proved difficult. Khan turned the government over to civilians in the fall, but continued to intrigue as head of the armed forces. The 
political turmoil intensified. In February, with Ambassador Taylor's approval, Khan's own military colleagues rebelled against him and banished him to the United Nations. Though a stable government remained elusive, the campaign of bombing North Vietnam began. It was called Rolling Thunder. We thought that at a certain point, and in conjunction with a situation within the South that was turned around, uh, it would be a decisive thing in getting Hanoi to say, all right, we can't get there now. We will fall back, not abandon the objective of taking over the South, but, but drop it for now. We never had the view that bombing would bring about quick results certainly not on the essentially measured scale that was uh, actually carried out. We thought it would cut down the amount of the infiltration that by hitting the supply lines you'd make it much more difficult. I had been a director of the United States Strategic uh, Bombing Survey at the, uh, toward the end of the Second World War, and we'd made a detailed study of the effects of strategic bombing on uh, not only the German war economy, but on the psychology of the, of the German people. I was convinced that uh, we were not going to achieve our will by bombing the North, that uh, in the first place uh, it was a fairly primitive industrial society and that they, they weren't the kind of targets that would, uh, were adapted for strategic bombing. And secondly, I was convinced that uh, we would never break the will of a determined people by simply by bombing. And in fact, we would probably tend to unite them more than ever. The Tan Hoa Bridge, 80 miles from Hanoi, was an important target in the spring of 1965. It was bombed and repaired year after year. When the bombing program started, I realized that the airfields, and we had three jet-capable airfields, were extremely vulnerable. If that uh, strategy was uh, to be a viable one, we had to protect those airfields. I feared that the Vietnamese uh, did not have the capability of protecting uh, the American aircraft on those airfields, and therefore my first request for troops were associated with protecting the airfields. The president granted Westmoreland's request with a little debate. On March 8th, 1965, 3,500 U.S. Marines landed to protect the airbase at Da Nang. The decision to deploy these first Marines was not part of a plan for a massive troop buildup, but 200,000 troops would be committed by the end of the year. My opinion was, let's not bring any ground forces in until we have to. Once you get, the, in the, get into this business, how do you turn back? Now, there was no, no one was blind about the danger of that first soldier Marine coming ashore. I certainly wasn't. Once the decision was made, the Marines decided to come ashore. As far as I was concerned, that's that. Let's go, boys, as fast as we can receive these troops logistically and have a real mission for them. Three weeks after the Marines landed, the Viet Cong attacked the American Embassy in Saigon. More Americans. Uh... No, principally logistical support, arms, munitions, 
training assistance. As many as 5,000, sir, we've heard this report. No, I'm not uh, discussing primarily additional personnel. In early April, Johnson tried to keep the troop deployments a secret. In fact, two additional Marine battalions had already hit the beach as Secretary McNamara spoke. Others followed week by week with little fanfare. 72,000 troops were committed that spring. One of the reasons for this gradualness in our buildup of resistance in South Vietnam was uh, due to the fact that we did not want to present Moscow and Hanoi with a major new situation during any given week, which would require them to go through an orgasm of decision-making based upon worldwide strategic considerations. And so each week was not all that different than the week before. In early April, Johnson also changed the mission of troops. The passive defense of air bases lasted less than a month. When the Marines were first landed at Da Nang, uh, we were told that the objective was to defend the, the air base. Uh, how do you resolve that, sir, with your statements in Saigon that their objective is to kill the Viet Cong, to seek them out and kill them? Well, I did say that. I think that goes along with uh, our objective, uh, our mission, our assignment to defend that big uh, uh, complex uh, at Da Nang and Phu Bai. Uh, you can't defend a, a place like that by sitting on your ditty box. You've got to get out and aggressively uh, patrol. And that's what our people are doing. And the one thing I emphasized to them while I was out there was to find these Viet Cong and kill them. A U.S. president, for the first time, had authorized ground troops for offensive operations in Vietnam. Their patrols were limited to a 50-mile radius of coastal bases, Johnson was moving with caution. But these additional troops and their expanded role were also designed to show Ho Chi Minh his determination. Five days after he committed them, Johnson made Ho an offer. The vast Mekong River can provide food and water and power on a scale to dwarf even our own TVA. Johnson offered Ho a vast development project to benefit all of Southeast Asia if Ho would abandon his goals. And we remain ready with this purpose for unconditional discussions. Coming back in the helicopter from that speech in 1965 at Johns Hopkins University, where he had promised a TVA for the Mekong Valley, if only Ho Chi Minh would be reasonable, he leaned across to an assistant, put his hand on his knee and said, Old Ho can't turn that down. Old Ho can't turn that down. You see, if Ho Chi Minh had been George Meany, Lyndon Johnson would have had a deal. Mr. Secretary, what is your reaction to the announcement from the communist side rejecting our offer of negotiation? Well, we regret that. As President Johnson said Saturday, there have been many disappointments of the past week. That is one. We stand ready and willing to talk any time, any place. Has, has our uh, bombing attack really hurt the North Vietnamese? I don't think there's any question but what it has. In particular, during the past two weeks, we've concentrated on bridges and the routes of communication. have destroyed many of these, and this can't help but delay the movement of men and material to the communists in the South. This film was staged by the East Germans. But the message was true. The bombing campaign was not working. Supplies from North Vietnam were reaching far into the South. in the spring of 1965. Every report, the CIA, the military, the embassy, uh, independent observers who had been there was saying, Vietnam is on the verge of collapse. And the president says, I feel like a hitchhiker caught in a hailstorm on a Texas highway. I can't run, I can't hide, and I can't make it stop. By the spring of 1965, the war had changed. Large units of Viet Cong replaced guerrillas as the main fighting force. In June, they destroyed the military outpost of Dong Suai and much of the village.
Saigon lost 800 of its best troops. The army of South Vietnam was near collapse. The civilian government did collapse at that time, and the military took over. I asked all of them, 60 or 70 of them, you know, in the room. I said, OK, uh, one more time. Anyone want to be prime minister? <laughs> and he said, no. So Tio said, uh, I propose key. And uh, all of them just, just stood up and, you know, uh, accept uh, 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 the offer. But then I, I didn't give them the answer. I, I said I have to go back and talk with my wife first. And uh, when I told her about that offer, you know, she, she, uh, she was not excited. She said, oh, no, not that job, not as a prime minister. <laughs> I'm not a good politician, I'm not a good diplomat. You know, I think all I know, uh, the only thing I can do well is, you know, flying the airplane. I said, well, what can I do now? <laughs> I feel it's important at this juncture that we prepare for the long pull. The situation was desperate. Westmoreland conferred in July with Secretary McNamara and General Wheeler, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He had asked for an immediate troop increase to 125,000 men, 200,000 by year's end. Johnson approved the request while McNamara was in Saigon. The president then had a series of high-level meetings staged as a genuine debate to seek consensus on the decision he had quietly made. I remember him turning to Wheeler and he said to him, you're asking for 200,000 more men now. What happens if in two, three, four years you ask me for 500,000 men? A very prophetic statement. What do you expect me to do? How can I respond to it? What makes you think Ho Chi Minh won't match us for every man we send in? And another time to the group, he said, we've got two questions that we've got to answer. Can Westerners fight a war in Asian jungles? And number two, how on earth can we fight a war under the direction of others whose governments topple like bowling pins? He said, now, somebody answer those questions for me. And explaining to the president the, the concern that I felt about a mounting escalation, I said to him, you know, once on the tiger's back, we can't pick the, the, the time to dismount. You're going to lose control of this situation, and this could be very serious. Secretary McNamara framed the three options. Option number one was to cut our losses and get out. Option number two was a middle course. Option number three was to give the military in Vietnam what it wanted. Listen to the way the first option was phrased cut our losses and withdraw under the best conditions that can be arranged. Almost certainly conditions humiliating the United States and very damaging to our future effectiveness on the world scene. <laughs> now you're president and you have this memorandum from the Secretary of Defense and it says you can cut our losses and withdraw under the best conditions. However, it's going to make a fool of you in the world. I mean, that was an option, the very framing of which presumed its rejection. Our reputation as a nation consisted of many things, not the least of which was that we had some sense of perspective and therefore had some judgment. While many of our allied countries were beginning to think that we had, were out of our minds to pursue such a futile war. Peace has been maintained because people in certain other capitals would say to themselves, now look, comrades, we'd better, better be a little careful here because those damned fool Americans just might do something about it. If that question in their minds got to be a sense of certainty that we would not do something about it, then I think we'd be exposed to very great dangers. I found him the most sympathetic of all of the people in the entourage. He was the one who seemed to take my, my cautionary views most seriously. He was the one who seemed to be probing more and more deeply for a way out, but he could never reconcile uh, extrication with his 
personal commitment that uh, he would not be the first president to lose a war. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can foresee, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power. But we will not surrender, and we will not retreat. We intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. There was no major address before Congress. Johnson already had his Tonkin Gulf resolution. And there was no major announcement on primetime television. Johnson disclosed his decision in a press conference at midday. I think it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the president wanted as low-keyed an announcement as he could get and as little uh, energetic public debate as possible. We did make a deliberate decision not to create a war fever in this country. You didn't see members of the armed forces or units of the armed forces parading through American cities. You didn't see pretty movie stars out selling bonds and factories and things like that, all the things we did during World War II. Because we felt that in this nuclear world where thousands of megatons are lying around in the hands of frail human beings, it's just too dangerous for an entire people to become too angry. We're going to do everything we can with our left hand to negotiate an agreement that will allow people to breathe free independently. Independent of any ideology of ours or of anyone else's. Give them the right of choice. And if we do that, we'll come home tomorrow. As Lyndon Johnson spoke on the White House lawn, a Marine rifle company left Danang for a cluster of hamlets nearby. Viet Cong from this area had recently hit Danang in a mortar attack, and they had shot seven Marines on an earlier sweep. If I resist them, if I deter them, if we keep our commitment of the three presidents have made, President Eisenhower, President Kennedy, and the present president, then the people say, well, you should come on home. What happens uh, there doesn't matter. If you stay there, there's some say, well, you ought to get it over with in a hurry. So some want to go and blow up everything. Some want to come and blow up nothing and leave and get out and forget them. We're trying to do the reasonable thing to say that power and brute force and aggression are not going to prevail. You can't do this thing by force. Now let's sit down and reason it out and let's try to allow these people a choice. Now that's what I'm trying so hard to do and that's what I need uh, your help on. people concern themselves something with a country that's trying to maintain her independence from aggression, that's being invaded. Johnson called it invasion. Hanoi called it liberation. 
In the fall of 1965, three North Vietnamese regiments massed in the Central Highlands. Nearly two years had passed since Johnson renewed the U.S. commitment to defend South Vietnam. Nearly two years had passed since Ho Chi Minh renewed his commitment to liberate the South. Now their two armies braced for battle. Westmoreland feared the North Vietnamese would cut South Vietnam in two. He would block them with his sky troopers, the first air cavalry. Now America wins the wars that she undertakes, make no mistake about it. And we have declared war on ignorance and illiteracy. We have declared war on poverty. We have declared war on disease. And we have declared war on tyranny and aggression. And we not only stand for these things, but we're willing to stand up and die for these things. Westmoreland sent the air cavalry in search of Hanoi's army poised in a river valley at the foot of the Chupong Mountains. For the first time, in the Battle of the Yadrang Valley, Americans fought the North Vietnamese face to face. time, B-52s supported troops in the field. For the first time to Americans, Vietnam meant a major new war. How many men who listen to me tonight have served their nation in other wars? How very many are not here to listen? The war in Vietnam is not like these other wars. Yet, finally, war is always the same. It is young men dying in the fullness of their promise. It is trying to kill a man that you do not even know well enough to hate. Therefore, to know war is to know that there is still madness in this world. We have children to teach, and we have sick to be cured, and we have men to be freed. There are poor to be lifted up, and there are cities to be built, and there's a world to be helped. Yet, we do what we must, 
I am hopeful, and I will try with best I can with everything I've got to end this battle and to return our sons to their desires. Yet, as long as others will challenge America's security and test the dearness of our beliefs with fire and steel, then we must stand or see the promise of two centuries tremble. From 1965 through 1967, nearly one and a third million Americans went to war in Vietnam, a war they will always remember. It's, it's not like the San Francisco 49ers on one side of the field and the Cincinnati Bengals on the other. Uh, the enemy is all around you. America takes charge, next on Vietnam. This program was produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for this series was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, by public television stations, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over a hundred years providing worldwide business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers. Additional funding was provided by the George D. Smith Fund, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and other contributors. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Vietnam, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. TV series chief correspondent Stanley Carno has written the companion book, Vietnam, A History, published by the Viking Press and available in bookstores and libraries. <whistles> ¶¶